That clip, of course, is uh, from the movie Apocalypse Now. And the reason I started with that is because I always wondered if the doors would ever get into church. <laughs> you, you have to be old to get that joke. But anyway, they made it this morning. <laughs> But we're going to start a study in the book titled The Apocalypse. That's the Greek title to the word. And I, I started with this because what people often think of when they hear the word apocalypse is just what's depicted there. Uh, destruction, all sorts of bad things. And I, I hope I can disabuse us of that uh, definition of the word as we go along. But uh, about a year ago, someone asked me to do a series on the seven churches in the book of what we call in English Revelation or the Apocalypse and uh, I wasn't too keen on that because it's, it's a tough subject there's a lot of information a lot of misinformation out there about it but uh, the Holy Spirit kept kind of bringing it back to me and bringing it back so finally I decided okay I will do uh, seven messages one on each church well of course I began to do that and uh, the, the story of the churches show up in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. And I thought, well, how can we start in chapter 2 if we don't start in chapter 1? Uh, we're not going to have the foundation to understand what's in 2 and 3. So we're going to start this morning in chapter 1. Hopefully it'll only take us a couple of weeks uh, to get to chapter 2. And then we'll go through the seven churches and uh, see what happens uh, from there. Well, why is it uh, that the book of Revelation is so difficult? I, mean, I told some people today that I feel like my head's about ready to explode as I've been reading all the things I could uh, find on, on uh, Revelation this last week. You know, and there are so many schools of thought, uh, so many camps, you know. So, you know, what are you? Are, are you an amillennialist, a premillennialist, a postmillennialist? Are you a dispensationalist, a preterist, a futurist, a historist? Well, what school do you fall into? And we could go on and on with the names. And then most of those groups have subgroups within them. So uh, you all probably fit somewhere in there. And so do I. But we're not going to worry about that. And we're not really going to worry about uh, times and dates and that sort of thing. What we're going to worry about is uh, what Mike shared with us. And that is that this book is just what it says it is in the first verse. I'd like you to really look at that. Chapter 1, verse 1. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to the servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So this book is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what we're going to do as we go through it is we're going to try to see him and see what it is he's saying to us and what he said to the church through the ages and, and see what we can get out of it. So let's go back to that word apocalypse. It's simply a transliteration. It's like baptize. It's just translated into English letters. Now if I were to come to you and say... I have seen a vision, assuming I, I see visions, which I don't, by the way, but assuming I did, I came to you and I said, I've seen a vision that you are going to have an apocalyptic event in your finances. Would you be happy about that? You would not. That's because you are not first century individuals. You are 21st century individuals. If you were a first century individual and I came to you and I said, you are about to have an apocalypse. You'd say, great, bring it on. We'll talk about that a little more as we go along. One of the reasons revelation is so difficult is because words are dynamic. They change meaning over the course of years and centuries and so on and so forth. Revelation, apocalypse, apocalypse just means that. It means a revelation. It means an unveiling. It means now you're going to be able to see clearly what's going on. It doesn't mean the world's coming to an end. It doesn't mean that something bad's going to happen in its original context. And the original context is what we want to find out here. So to a first century Christian, that would be a good thing. That means we're going to be enlightened now. And that's what this book is really all about, is to enlighten us about Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And so we'll see that as we go through it. 
Another problem with the book of Revelation that makes it hard for us is the genre that it's written in. And it, it's so difficult for us, it's full of phenomenological language and, and pictures and that. And we are Westerners in the sense of Western European thought. In other words, we think linearly. We think in facts. Uh, and, and we start at the beginning and we go through to the end. Now that's not bad, but that's not the way Revelation is written. It's written for, in an Eastern mindset, Middle Eastern mindset. And they think all over the map. And so what, you see something here and you see something over there and you try to think, well, this isn't, and it, it just doesn't compute all the time because we approach it from our analytical point of view. Again, that's not bad, that's who we are, but when we approach something then, some literature like this, prophetic genre literature, we have to begin to think in pictures and we have to begin to think, well, maybe the middle's at the end and the front's at the, you know, and it's all mixed up. So we'll, we'll work through a little bit of that as we go along. Uh, another problem is our lack of knowledge about what the rest of the Bible says about the subject. I don't know about you guys, but when I first accepted the Lord, I was 30 years old, I'd been raised in the church, so I kind of knew what was in the Bible. The first thing I wanted to study was the book of Revelation. I wanted to know how this thing was going to end. You know? And so many people do that. They jump right in there, they want to know it. But you can't know what the book of Revelation is saying unless you know what the New Testament has said, and you can't know that unless you know what the Old Testament has said. So you have to have some background going into the thing if you're going to be able to figure it out. And I think about a, a 19th century person, his name was Moses Stewart. Moses Stewart taught theology at Andover uh, Theological Seminary. And uh, as, he be, as he taught, and as his reputation grew as a Bible scholar, his students petitioned him uh, to uh, do a lecture series on the book of Revelation. And uh, so he pondered that, and he said, all right, I will, but I need some time to study the background in the Old Testament. Now here's a guy that could probably put any of us, not probably, could absolutely put any of us under the table when it comes to uh, knowing the Bible. And yet he said, before I can lecture on the book of Revelation, I have to have more background information. So he began to study the prophets in the Old Testament. It took him 10 years before he felt he was ready to begin to lecture on the book of Revelation. Can you imagine that? He knew what he was talking about. And then out of his lectures came his two-volume commentary, which is a mere 1,100 pages on the book of Revelation. I thought about reading it, and that's as far as it went. So, background is important because it's a difficult book if we just jump into it. Now, it has, it has never been documented, but it has been said that uh, John Calvin, uh, possibly the greatest theological mind that ever lived, and he lived, by the way, in between Augustine and Jonathan Edwards, the other, the other two that would vie for that title. And, and they asked Calvin one time, Why did you not write a commentary on the book of Revelation? He wrote several other commentaries. And he simply replied, I don't understand it. So if Calvin didn't think he understood it completely, we aren't going to understand it completely when we get finished either. But hopefully we'll understand a little more about the central person in the book, and that is Jesus Christ. One final word about one of the reasons this book is so hard, it's because when we read it, we tend to engage in what we call asegesis rather than exegesis. And I think I have those two words up there somewhere. Somewhere. It's revelation. Reveal it to us, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> if those words are unfamiliar to you, they're, they're theological jargon words, and they're just talk about the study of Scripture. And there's two prefixes there, ace and ex. And in Greek, uh, ace means into, and ex means out of. So when we engage in Bible study, our goal is to do exegesis. We're to look at the text, see what it's saying, and draw the meaning out of the text and put it into our lives. 
Asegesis is where we look at the text. Oh, I know this over here, so I'm going to put that into the text. And that's not good. That's where you end up reading the newspaper and you say, oh gee, the world must be coming to an end now because there's a crisis in the Middle East. Well, there's been a crisis in the Middle East since the beginning of Genesis. Okay. So you can't look at history, you can't look at current events and impose them upon this book, though it's been done uh, for years by various well-meaning people. So we're going to try not to do that. It's a difficult task, but we're going to try to avoid it. Our job as we study the seven churches will be to avoid these interpretational bogs and discover a couple of three things. One, what did God intend to convey to the original churches? And what implications does that mass message have for our lives? And the other and most important is that Jesus Christ will be more fully revealed to us. Because knowing everything about the end times isn't going to do us a bit of good if we don't know Jesus Christ. That's who we want to know. So we're going to try to do that. And hopefully it'll be fun as we go along. And uh, maybe a, a little controversial. But that's all right. A little controversy won't hurt us. I'd like to begin at the very beginning. Revelation or Apocalypse? Now like I said, like baptized, uh, Apocalypse is simply a transliteration and it would have a totally different meaning to the first century reader. So when he said, write this letter, and by the way, all of you who insist on putting an S on the end of Revelation, don't. It's one letter, it's one revelation. Okay, it's not Revelations. Revelation, one letter written to seven churches. Okay? They all got the same letter. They could all read about what was, their, what was going on in their church and they could also read about what was going on in these other churches. And we'll talk about that some more as we go along. It is not merely a revelation of a pr prophetic plan, but the revealing of a person, of our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. He is revealed as the Messiah of Israel, the Lord of the church, and the judge of the world. And we'll see that, how it plays out. Note, the book is not called the hiding. It's not called the mystery. It's not called the puzzle, as so often we think about it in those terms. It's called the revelation or the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. It completes the story that's begun in Genesis. In Genesis we have the beginning, in Revelation we have the end. Where the entrance of sin is recorded without its judgment, when we exit the Bible we see that it's complete. Sin is done away with. And God establishes or finishes establishing his kingdom. So when you hear that word apocalypse, try not to think of the movie, try not to think of something terrible happening, but try to think about something being unveiled to you, something revealed to you. Well, when will these things be? That's the question everybody always wants to know. When will these things be? Well, it's a, it's a futile question because we've already been told, right? Jesus told us, didn't he? And what did he tell us? that nobody knows. Only the Father knows. Not even he knew when he was here on earth in his humanity when these things were going to be. So it, it amazes me that again this is our Western thinking and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I like Western civilization guys. I, I really do. Uh, but we want to know the end here. We know the beginning. We want the middle. We want the end. And we want to know the time and the date. Well you're not going to know. It's just that simple. It's also interesting to me that every Christian that ever lived thought they were living in the last days, the end times, that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime before they knocked the coffee over again. <laughs> so that's interesting. That tells us something. If, if the greatest theological minds of all time, beginning with none other than the Apostle Paul and, and the disciples, thought Jesus was going to return and complete the kingdom in their time, Hmm, how could they be so wrong? Well, maybe they weren't. We'll see as we go along. 
We don't know when that day will be. But we do know a lot about the time frame covered in this book we call Revelation. So let's deal with this term, the last days. Again, our Western mind, we hear the last days, we, we immediately think of a given day, don't we? Or, or maybe a week of days or something. Well, the last days, and this is pretty well established, there's not a lot of controversy over this, the last days began at the cross. That was the inauguration of the end times, was at the cross. So that's why we can say we're living in the last days, and Paul lived in the last days, and everybody in between lived in what the Bible calls the last days. We must keep in mind also that this book was written to seven real churches. They existed at the time. And so, what we want to find out here is, what is it God was saying to those seven churches? And what is it we can learn from them? Also, this book begins, each message to the churches begins, by telling them that these things will happen soon. You look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1, to show you the things that must soon take place. You look at the last phrase in, in verse 3, for the time is near. You go clear over to chapter 22, verse 6 and 7, and it says the same thing. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. So our sense of time sort of gets warped in here. You see? And so we look around. I mean, I hear people all the time. They say, oh, look at what's going on in the Middle East. The Lord must be coming back soon. Well, he may be coming back soon, but it's not in response to what's going on in the Middle East or in response to anything else. He has the thing all choreographed before he ever established this earth or this universe. His time was settled in his mind. Current events have nothing to do with it. Uh, since I've been a Christian 30 years, I've gone through all the books. You know, I used to be able to go to the bookstore. They don't have bookstores hardly anymore. But, and you could look at all the books. And it always amazed me. All these books, you know, the Mideast and the oil crisis and the end of time. And this and that and the other thing means the end of time. And what, what was really amazing to me is the same guy that wrote the book in 1965 about the end of the world being in the next five years wrote a book in 1975 about the end of the world coming in the next five years. Well, if you do the math, somehow he must have been wrong the first time, and he's just as wrong the second time. So we'll, we'll kind of uh, have to change the way we think about time. Well, we mentioned Old Testament background. All the pageantry of Revelation is played out against an Old Testament background. As we mentioned, everything begun in the Old Testament is completed in Revelation. The mysteries of the Old Testament, you remember Paul used that word a lot, he talked about the mysteries of the Old Testament and the mystery of the Jews and, and that. Well, now that mystery is solved in the book of Revelation. It's revealed, the mysteries of the Old Testament are revealed in, in the book of Revelation. Case in point, uh, Daniel chapter 12 verse 4. Uh, here's what God tells to Daniel after he sees all these things. But you, Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. So Daniel was told to shut this book up, seal it until the time of the end. Daniel sealing this book symbolizes then a long period of time and some epochal event that's going to happen in that period of time. Well, it was a long time from Daniel until the book of Revelation was written, 500 years more or less. There was a major event, wasn't there, in that period of time? And what was that major event? Jesus came to earth, was crucified, arose from the dead. That, folks, changes everything. That is the beginning of the end. We, we read in the book of Revelation that when John sees this book and it's sealed up, well, later on in, in Revelation we read this, and the book sealed up, and he's all distraught because no one is worthy to break the seals and open the book. But what happens? Then he sees, 
And, and this is, I'm, I'm going to give you an idea of why it's hard. He sees the Lion of Judah, and then he sees the Lamb, same person, right? See? Lion and Lamb, same person, so he can see two things, and they can both be the same thing. And the same thing is, of course, Jesus, who steps forward and breaks the seal. So the seal on the book has been broken. The thing that was sealed up in the Old Testament has been revealed because Jesus Christ was worthy to break that seal. In Revelation 5, we see the lamb and the lion as the same person. That always used to bug me too. You know, how, how do you have a lamb and a lion and the same deal? In it? But they are. And we don't have time to go into all that, but so be it. Number four, we need to understand that this book is written to a church that is under attack. Now, the first century church struggled. They were under attack a lot. And isn't it great that the 21st century church isn't? <laughs> no, same thing, right? Sure it is. Now, we don't have to worry about the Romans busting the door down, but if we lived in some places in Africa, we would, or if we lived some places in Asia, we would. See, but we Americans, I think it's one of the reasons uh, that uh, there was a certain strange of uh, theology, end times theology, that was very popular in the 20th, 20th century in evangelical churches. And I think the reason it was is because we're so insulated from that stuff. And we don't think that we live in a time when the church is persecuted. But it's just because we're blessed and we live in a place where the church isn't so persecuted. You know, we, we still are a little bit. In fact, I noticed in the paper the other day, uh, there was an article in there, and how the, they're starting to shift things now. And I believe it was Indonesia, uh, there was a terrorist attack on a group of people. It was not reported as Islamic terrorism, or even terrorism, but it was reported, it was labeled as religious terrorism. Now, maybe I'm a conspiracy nut. I don't know. I try not to be. But it seems to me like that's just one more step in moving all religions into this realm of terroristic organizations. Therefore, we should have rules and laws against all religions. I don't know. Just wild-eyed speculation. Uh, but it's something to think about. We already mentioned that the last days begin at the cross. Now, it's hard for us to grasp that. They, they begin here, and here it is, 2,100 years later, and they're still going on. How is that? How can we get a, wrap our minds around that? Well, we have a guy by the name of Oscar Kuhlman who will help us. And Oscar Kuhlman was a 20th century, uh, he was actually Swiss, but he's educated in, in Germany, so we call him a German uh, theologian. And he came up with this thing he calls the D-Day Analogy. Okay, and you remember D-Day, June 6th? Well, you may not remember it, but you know the date, you know, June 6th, 1944. And he says, in the D-Day analogy, June 6th, 1944, was the beginning of the end days for the Third Reich. Okay? We made an assault on Normandy. Now, he's equating this to the crucifixion of Christ. When Christ was crucified, he made an assault on all of Satan's kingdom. Okay. Had the Germans repelled us at Normandy, they likely would have won the war. But we established a beachhead. We began the beginning of the end of the Third Reich. Now, it wasn't until May 8, 1945, that we declared to be VE Day, or Victory Day. So there's a year in between, and what went on during that year? All hell broke loose, didn't it? You know, the Battle of the Bulls, Hurtigan Forest, all those things. It, there was a, a terrible time. Okay? And so it is with this book, and Coleman's analogy. Christ on the cross is the beachhead of Satan's demise. 
But as he chose us in this book, the church is going to spend a lot of time fighting a lot of battles until the end of that assault is over. But he also shows us in this book that we win. You see? And so this book is not meant to browbeat us and, oh, the end is coming, it's going to be terrible, you've got to look out for this, we've got to identify this guy and identify that guy. And You know, I sat through a lot of sermons when I was a kid on Social Security being the mark of the beast. You know, and we laugh at that now, but, th but that was a big deal. You know, if, man, that was, that was it because that's how they were going to identify everybody and you weren't going to be able to buy and sell. And, and then computers came along and, oh, well, there it is, you know. Well, Falderall. Don't worry about that stuff. We see the, we see the beginning, and it's going to be a, a fight to the end. And in the end, from chapter 20 on, we see the big victory celebration. You see? Is it going to be hard between beginning and end? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be hard. There's going to be a lot of struggles. We're going to lose some battles. But we'll win some battles, too. And in the end we will be able to declare our VE Day. Satan lost the decisive battle. The decisive battle actually I, I, I don't think took place on the cross. I think the decisive battle took place in the garden when Jesus was there on his knees. And in his humanity he cried out to the Father and he said, if there be any other way let this cup pass from me but not my will, but thine be done. I think that's where the battle took place. And that's where it takes place in our hearts and our minds too. Is when we're faced with a decision and the right thing to do is so difficult and every ounce of our humanity says, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. And the battle rages, doesn't it? See? And had Satan won that battle, had Jesus got up from his knees and walked away and said, no, I'm not going to do it. We would have lost. And literally all hell would have broken loose. But he didn't. He did the right thing. He said, not my will, but yours be done. And right there, Satan, you, if you read through Revelation, you find him as a dragon. His demise was sealed. That was our D-Day. The ultimate enemy, the dragon, the Satan of old. Yet he still manifests massive cunning by attacking the church from within and without. And we'll see that as we go along. Mostly from within, because that's who the, the, the letter is dealing with. It's, deal, it's written to Christians. It's not written for non-Christians. It's written to who? Seven churches. Okay? So, uh, we, we'll see that God mostly... You know, the church is always hurt more from within than from without. In fact, it's interesting that usually persecution from without drives the church together and makes it stronger. Persecution from within divides the church and makes it weaker. So we'll see how he deals with that. As we continue to look in Revelation, we find that uh, we have the dragon in there, and of course that's Satan. And we find that in, these, in this letter, John deals with uh, physical threats, spiritual threats, and material seduction. Now you think about that. Think about that to the to 21st century church. Physical threats, spiritual deception, and material seduction. Now we're here in beautiful Camas, Washington, Washougal, Vancouver, where we happen to live, and we don't really face physical threats, do we? No. You know. No. But, do we face spiritual deception? Yeah, of course we do. Do we uh, face material seduction? Sure we do. We get our eyes off of Christ, we get our eyes on things, we get our eyes on, on all sorts of stuff we shouldn't be messing with. We will see all these things. The visions in Revelation 12 through 19 symbolize these things. 
Uh, the beast from the sea, physical threat. Um, the beast from the land called the false prophet, spiritual deception. And the harlot, material deception, material seduction. We will see all of these forces being battled by our seven very real churches. In fact, I think we have a little slide. We'll, we'll talk more about this next time. When the slide is revealed to us. <laughs> anyway, we'll find that these seven churches are very real places. We'll be able to see them someday. <laughs> but I want to say a word about numbers because numbers are very significant in the book of Revelation too. But you can't get carried away with those either. There's a little caveat for you. But they are very significant. Yay! Seven churches. Okay, you see the seven churches there in Asia Minor. You see the island of Patmos. That's where John's at uh, when he writes this letter. So those are seven very real churches. But here's the question for you. How many churches do you think there were in existence at that time? Okay. Obviously more than seven, right? Okay. Well, why then... Do you well, let me ask another question. Do you think the other churches that existed were all perfect and therefore didn't need to hear from the Lord? No. No, not if they had any people in them. So why then does he send this letter to these seven churches and why only seven churches? Well, as we read through the book of Revelation, the most common number we come upon is seven. It shows up over and over and over again. And seven in, in the Bible generally speaks of all-inclusive. It's the number of completion. Seven days to create the earth, uh, whatever. We see the seven horns and seven this and seven that. And it just means that it, it embodies all of them. So what he's trying to say to us is, he's sending this letter to these seven churches because in these seven churches reside all of the things we need to be warned about. They have all the same problems that will bedevil the church in one sense or another until our Lord returns. That's why just seven churches. And we'll talk more about that next time. I just want you to know they're real places, but the significance of the seven is just that. And finally, and this is the most important part of today's message, the victory is Christ alone. That's the good news. We're going to take communion here in a few minutes, and we're going to celebrate the setting up the beachhead, so to speak. You know? Always, in every age and place, the church has been under attack. The dragon. He doesn't go away. He can't hurt Christ, so who, what's the next best thing? If, if I wanted to hurt you, what's the best way to do it if I can't physically hurt you? Hurt the one you love. See? And so Satan can't get at Christ. He can't get at the Father. He can't get at the Holy Spirit. So what does he do? He gets at the church, Christ's bride, which is made up of you and I. Our only safety lies in seeing the ugly hostility of the enemy clearly and clinging fast to our champion, King Jesus. Okay? Now, notice I said clinging fast. You know, you've got to hang on tight because if you don't, you get pried away through either physical harm, spiritual uh, corruption or material seduction. So as we look at these opening chapters of Revelation, our purpose is not to determine the dates or some hidden message, but to see clearly Jesus and the message of triumph He has for us whose names have been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb, Jesus, who was slain. Now, I don't know about you, but I heard a lot of sermons, too, on how we have to make sure that we don't succumb to the mark of the beast. You ever hear a sermon about that? No? Yeah, some of you have. 
Okay? How many of you, I can, well, let me, let me refer you. I can tell you exactly, with absolutely total accuracy, how many Christians will succumb to the mark of the beast? You know how many? That's right. None. Zero. Can't happen. Impossible. Look with me here at uh, <clears throat> Revelation 13, verse 8. And this is a good verse. If, if you don't know it, you should mark it in your Bible because it tells you about this mark of the beast. Now I'll just pick it up here, eh, verse 5. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blasphemies, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Now watch this. Everyone except those whose name is written in the book of life before the foundation of the earth. So if your name's in that book, you don't have to worry about the beast. And that is the message of Revelation throughout, is take a breath, relax, don't worry about all this stuff. Here it is, it's going to happen. He lays it out for us. But you don't have to worry about it because your name was written in that book, as Paul tells us in Ephesians, before the foundation of the earth. Okay? So there won't be one single Christian take the mark of the beast, whatever that happens to be. Okay? So one more thing that you don't have to worry about. We will not seek to know every detail of this book. Uh, Dennis E. Johnson in his, uh, what I think, excellent commentary on the book of Revelation says this in the introduction. He says, an abundance of detail can confuse rather than clarify. And isn't that the truth? Sometimes our minds can get so cluttered up with the details, we forget to see the big picture. Now, that's one of the things that, that's uh, wrong with the way sometimes we approach the Bible. Uh, we take people that are brand new Christians, and we want to immerse them in a few verses here, and they never get the big picture. So we have to start with the big picture. The most significant pattern to be grasped is the movement from conflict to victory and the identity of the victors and if you want to see one up close and personal look in the mirror see? because it's you and it's me it's all those who are in Christ we're the victors doesn't mean it won't be hard doesn't mean we won't have to fight some battles but we're the victors let me read from you here Chapter 21, the first four verses of the book of Revelation, we'll close with this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. It's pretty cool. Now that's VE Day. Okay? It may be in the next five minutes. I don't know. Maybe in the next 5,000 years. But one way or another, we're going to get there. Pray with me.